In this tutorial we're going to show you how you can import and export 3D data into the software. We'll begin by looking at the various files that we can import into both VCarve and Aspire and then later on in the tutorial we're going to look at the different file formats that we can import and export in Aspire only. So let's just go to File, Close now before we can import a 3D model into the software, we need to create a new file or open an existing file that we've worked on previously so that we can import the 3D data into. So let's go and create a new file. So here we're working with a single sided job. We'll give that a width of 10 inches, a height of 10 inches. Material thickness we're going to work with here is going to be half an inch. Set the Z0 on the top. XY date and position, we'll put that in the lower left hand corner. Modeling resolution, we're just going to make that very high and then we'll go ahead and press OK. Now we are demonstrating the first part of this tutorial in VCarve and anything that we look at in VCarve will also be applicable to Aspire users. Now to access 3D data we need to come down into the modeling tab and within the modeling tab in both VCarve and Aspire we can use this icon here to open up a 3D model. This will allow us to browse our system and search for 3D data. In VCarve we're able to open .v3m files, so these are native vectric files that you'll get with the software. You can also purchase more .v3m files from designandmake.com where you can access individual clip art or clip art projects. You can also open up other 3D mesh files such as .stl files. If we use this drop down menu here you can see all of the other 3D files that we can bring in, for example .obj files, .3dm files. And we're going to look at STL meshes created in third party software shortly. And Aspire users can import exactly the same files as VCarve with the additional Aspire files that are .crv 3D files and .3D clip files. And we'll talk more about those later on when we get to the Aspire side of the tutorial. So let's just cancel out here. Another way to bring in 3D data is by going into the Clip Art tab. So within the Clip Art tab we have what we call the Library Browser and we have our local files. So within the Library Browser I can use this option here to add a folder that contains Clip Art and bring that into the software. So let's do that. So we'll use the Add Folder option and so this will allow me to browse my computer for uh, 3D data. So here's the Clip Art folder, I've downloaded all the Clip Art that comes with this software. So I could select Clip Art, use the OK option, and you'll see that all of the Clip Art uh, is displayed in the lower part of the Clip Art tab here. So I'm able to see all of the Clip Art that is available to me. I'm also able to view the actual individual subfolders so I can see that they're organised into animals, borders, decorative and so on. And so with the software displaying the thumbnails for each of the clip art that we have, it just makes it easier for me to go through my library and select a piece of clip art that I wish to use. And then we have the Local Files tab. And again, this just allows me to navigate around folders within my PC. So at the moment, I'm currently looking in the Tutorial folder. And I could just go in and select, say, the Simple Crest. And it's going to display all of the V3Ms at the bottom here for me. Now, Aspire users will also be able to see .crv3d files and .3d clip files displayed as a thumbnail at the bottom here. So, to bring a piece of clip art in, I can drag that in, I could right click and import it to a level, or I could just simply double click and that will just bring that into my session. And if I just come over to this icon here, we can tile our windows, we'll go into the modeling tab. You can see that I now have a component listed here in my component tree, the fleur-de-lis, which we just 
imported into our session, I have a grayscale representation of that fleur de lis in the 2D view, and I can see the actual component itself here in the 3D view. So let's just take that and we're just going to go ahead and delete it. And so the import folder and the clip art tab are the main ways to bring 3D data into our session. So now we're going to look at importing data that was created in a different design package. So again, let's come over to the import 3D model icon. We're going to click on that and we're going to look at importing the Porsche.stl file from the project folder. So with that selected, let's go ahead and press open. Let's just maximize the 3D view there. Now, as this is a non-native file, the software will automatically open up the Orientate 3D model form. And so this form allows us to adjust position and size the model before we turn it into a component that we can then use in the software. Now, it displays the full model in the 3D view, so you can see the entire part there as I twiddle that around. Now, we can't import a full 3D object into the software as you see this model now. And that's because our modeling environment uses a grid of pixels to represent the 3D shapes. If we wanted to recreate this full 3D part, then we'd need to exit out of this form and switch to a two sided environment in the job setup form where you could then import the model and use this form to split the model into two separate parts which would create the top side and the bottom side of the 3D model which could then be machined creating toolpaths for each side of your material. Now there is a tutorial that covers the entire setup for importing third party 3D models to cut as part of a two sided job in much more detail and you can find that in the related video section for this tutorial. Now in this case we're just going to look at importing both sides of the Porsche model in a single sided setup so we could slice the part, cut it out and stick the parts together to create somewhat of a full model. Now at this stage we want to orient the model in a way that we can tell the software which part of it we want to use as a component. Now it's important to understand here that the model imported is at the size and orientation that it was created in the software program that it was originally modelled from. So we need to adjust the orientation and adjust the model size to match that of the part that we're working on. So to help us position our part, let's go and draw our origin. So we'll go to View, Draw Origin, and there we now display the origin arrows where we've got a green arrow that represents the Y axis, red arrow represents the X axis, and the blue arrow represents the blue axis. And it's just sometimes handy to have this visible whilst you're orienting and sizing up the part. So you've always got something to compare it to relative to which axis you're working with. So let's have a look at the initial orientation. Now at the moment we can see that the top is selected. We're we'll looking down the model at the top of the car. And so we're going to look at each of these options and each one of these options would reflect the orientations that the part was originally modelled and saved in. So, they, so these options here actually have no concept of the fact that the car has a top, a bottom, a front to back and so on. So you just need to click through these options until you found the orientation that you wanted. For example, if we go to right, you'll see we're looking at it from this point of view, we could go to the back, left, bottom, and we've got the front. Now in this case, uh, I do want to see the side of the car, so I'm going to leave that in the front orientation. Then we have the rotation about the z-axis. And so I can just click through each one of these and you'll see that it's just rotating the parts around. And this is just to help us get the initial orientation. But we could just do this after we imported it using the rotate tool.
And then we have the interactive rotation. So as well as the standard directions, we also have the ability to interactively rotate the model. And so this allows us to put the part at an angle rather than one of these directions. So the default is set to rotate the XYZ view. And so if I go into the 3D view, I can move that around. You'll see that my origin moves and the gray plane moves as well. And this just shows that I'm looking at the part from a different view. Then we could choose to interactively rotate this around the model view. So here we have the XYZ model view. And if I click on that, when I come to rotate the part, you'll see that we can rotate the model in all axes and the origin and the plane stay still. Now, as well as rotating in X, Y and Z, you may want to fix the axes of rotation. For example, you may want to rotate about the X axes. And so we can do that, the Y axes, and then we also have the Z axes, like so. And again, this just gives us more control to position the model than the standard options that we have in the initial orientation. To go back, we could just simply click on any of these, so we'll just go to right and we'll just switch back to the front view just to reset that. So now with that reset and in the orientation that I want with no rotations, I can look at sizing the part. Now this grey area here is no indication of my job size and it's purely here as a divider which we'll come to shortly. Now this red square however is an indication of my job space and I can see that the Porsche car is bigger than my actual workspace. And if we come over to the model size in the form we can see the X value for the car is just over 14 where my job space is 10 by 10. So we're going to look at changing the size of this so it fits within my 10 by 10 job. Now I'd like to use this option here to lock the XYZ ratio so that when I make a change to one of these values, the other two values will be updated in proportion to what I changed the first value. For example, if we go to the X box here and we're going to put in 9 inches in there, you'll see it will automatically update the others and I could go ahead and press apply and you'll see now that my Porsche is now sat within my 10 by 10 square. Now if I only wanted to change one of the values, I'd just simply uncheck that and make the change followed by applying that to update the newly input value. Moving down, you can see we've got the units, so we know that we're currently working in inches. Now if I wanted to change to millimetres, I could go over to millimetres and then I could use this scale millimetres and inches option. And when I click that, it's just going to do that by 25.4 and then I could just click that back and that'll just bring that back down by 25.4 and we'll make sure that inches is selected there. We also have this center model button here where you could reposition the entire model and the datum position is back to the center of the part and this is useful where you may have done lots of rotation and it may have gotten out of position so you just simply use the center model just to recenter that. So now that we've oriented and sized the part, we now need to choose how much of it we want to convert into a component. And this is done by positioning this grey plane that we referenced earlier. And this grey plane is what we call the zero plane. So let's have a look at the part up the Y axis. And so this line that we can see here is our zero plane. And I can use the slider bar here and as I move this you can see that it will split the model in different positions according to where I position the slider. I can also just click on these lines that we've got here so I can click and that will put it into the center. If I wanted to put it at the bottom I could double click on that line there. We can see the zero plane is now at the bottom and everything here would be converted as a component. 
I could also type in precise values. For example, if I only wanted the first one inch to be converted into a component, I could just simply type in one, press enter, and then it will move that. And so only the first inch of the model will be converted when we come to create that component. So let's just double click that to the middle so that it's at the centre of the part in terms of the Z axis. Then we have the option here to create both sides and we can see at the moment that is currently checked. So what that means is that it will create a component that's based on everything above the zero plane and it will create a component based on everything below the zero plane. And if I was to go ahead and press OK now, we'd have two components, one component which is at the top and one component that represents the bottom. Now if I was in a two-sided setup, we'd still use this slider here to split the model into two separate parts. The only difference is that we would see the top side of the model on the top side of your material and we'd see the bottom side of the model on the bottom side of the material. Now in our case we aren't working in a two-sided job here so both the top and the bottom sides of the Porsche will be placed on a single side where I could slice up the two parts in the software then machine them, stick them together to create somewhat of the full car. And again for more information on the process for importing models for two-sided machining there is a tutorial that covers the whole process from start to finish which can be found on the related videos section for this tutorial. Now if you didn't want to create both sides you can just simply uncheck the create both sides option but you then have the choice to discard the data below the zero plane so it's everything below the zero plane you can remove. In this case I'd like to check the option here to create both sides. Now Aspire users have an additional option at the bottom of the form where you can apply perspective along Z and this would apply a perspective distortion along the Z axis. So once you're happy with everything you could just simply go ahead and press OK. So here in the component tree I have Porsche top and I have Porsche bottom. Let's just go and tile our windows. I'm just going to take the Porsche bottom there and I'm going to select it again and I'm just going to press 9 on the keyboard and that's going to rotate that in increments of 45 degrees. Then I'm going to take that hold in Alt. I'm just going to hold down Alt just to keep that component in line vertically Then we'll take the top one there, hold down Alt and we'll just shift that up to the top there. Now as the components are created along a grid of pixels, we've now lost the underneath part of the car and underneath the space under the aerial there. What we have now is just a solid model. And here we could just work on this like a standard piece of clip art. We could edit it, size it, rotate it, maybe even look at the various modeling tools to edit the part too. For example, what we could do is we could take one of these cars and we could look at applying a smooth filter to remove the faceting that you can see on both of these components. Now, this faceting or this triangular area uh, were already in the model when we imported it and that's how the file was saved and this is fairly common in models found on the internet in mesh formats and if you create parts yourself in another software program you can control this by what tolerance you set when you export the part. So with that selected we could go and use the smooth filter and it will do that to fault of 50%. You could just uh, decrease that if you wanted to, depending on how you wanted your part to look. So now we're going to look at importing and exporting 3D data in Aspire. So we're going to close this session of VCarve down and look solely at the import and export options for Aspire only. So let's go and create a new file. So working with a single-sided job, Width is going to be 10 inches, height is going to be 10 inches, material thickness we're working with is half an inch, C0 on the top, XY in the lower left, we're going to work with a very high modelling resolution and then we could go ahead and press OK. 
So let's just navigate to the modeling tab there and we're going to navigate to our import 3D model or component folder. When I click on that, that's going to open up the area where I can select 3D data to bring into the software. So in Aspire we can import the same 3D files that we could in VCarve with the addition of .3D clip files and .CRV 3D files and you'll see those listed at the top here otherwise everything else is the same as VCarve. Now first I wanted to show you the difference between a .3D clip file and a CRV 3D file. Now we know that when we save a CRV 3D file that it may contain vectors, layers, 3D components, toolpaths and anything else that was created within the file. But if you import a component from a CRV 3D file, for example if I selected FLIR2.CRV 3D and then I pressed open, you're just going to get a single component that represents the composite model and it will take what it can see in the 3D view at the time that it was saved and it will import it at the size and place that it was originally created. So I could take that and say F9 to center that and if we tile the windows you can see that I just have one single component that represents that FLIR. I have the grayscale in the 2D view and I have the actual model there in the 3D view. Now if you had a file that contained a set of components, groups or levels and you exported it out as a .3D clip file, then the 3D clip file will retain the individual components as information within it. So let's just take this FLIR and we're just going to move that over to the left hand side. I'm going to come back up and we're going to look at importing the FLIR.3D clip file. So we're going to take that and just going to open it up. And if we just take that and just move that over to the right hand side here, I can see that when this was exported as a .3D clip file, it was exported as a group and this plus symbol is indicating that to me. Now in the 3D view, if you take a look at the two Fleur de Lis components, we can see they are pretty much exactly the same. However, because this one is a grouped component, I'm able to access all of the building blocks for the grouped part. And so to do that, I can just simply click on this plus symbol here, and you can see that we have four different components that make up this group. And if I wanted to access the individual parts, I could do so by right clicking on that group and using the ungroup option. And you'll see here that I can just select all the different parts and I can move them around and I could edit them if I wanted to. And this would only apply if you export the group or level out with individual pieces of clip art within it. So if you are saving out clip art files, the best bet is to export them out as .3D clip files rather than importing the models from the CRV 3D file. But as you saw earlier, you can import models from CRV 3D files, but the software will only bring the part in as one complete model. If you didn't have the .3D clip files, then you could open up the CRV 3D file and copy and paste the individual parts into the session that you're working with. So let's just take all of those components there and we're just going to delete them. Now that we've looked at all of the options for importing models that are native to Vectric software or third-party 3D data, we're now going to look at how we can import 2D files and create a 3D model from that. So let's come over to this icon here. Here we have the option to create a component from a selected or imported bitmap. And here I can select an image file to create a component from, where the software takes the light and dark areas of the image and applies height to it, where the light areas in the image are the highest part of a component and the dark areas are the lowest, and all shades in between are assigned a height and interpreted by how light or dark they are. And this is particularly good when working with specially prepared files like .tiff files. So let's have a look at this test.tiff file here. We'll select it, then we'll go ahead and press open. And if we just take that 
and if we just make that a little bigger then we can see that the area in the background is black and this is the area where we have no height and where there's lighter colors in that image file we've actually created a height there in the component and so you can see that we have a good clean model that we can work with minus this flat plane here now most images would be standard photographs or things that we have scanned so let's just take this and we're just going to delete it and to come back up use the option to create a component from a selected or imported bitmap and we're going to use the house.jpg file and we'll go ahead and press open so let's just size that or take it go into the size form I'm going to give that a width of 9 inches press apply close that down take that press F9 on the keyboard just to center that and if we just maximize the 3d view here you can see that we have quite a lot of noise there and so what we could do is we could look at using the smooth filter to control the amount of noise so with that selected let's go over to the smooth filter it's just going to do that at default 50% so you can see it's just really smoothed out that noise there so we could go ahead and press OK now all it's done is created a texture and we wouldn't really be able to carve this and see the same thing than if I was to model this as a 3D relief and so to show you this a little better let's look at scaling the Z height of this component so with that selected let's come over to the properties we're going to increase this to 0.375 and press spacebar to enter that in and then we could just close that down and if we twiddle the view there you can see that this really isn't very practical for us to machine and the reason that I show you this is that it's a common misconception within the software that you can just import an image and generate something that is the equivalent of someone creating a relief model but this is useful for creating texture and to apply the texture over the top of a 3D model or a background so let's just take that component we're just going to delete it so let's go and tile our windows we're going to go back up to create a component from a bitmap and in the folder we're going to import this post.jpg we'll go ahead and press open so here we could take that and we can look at just sizing that up so you can see in the image here we've got uh, a rather weathered post and if we take a look in the 3d view if we just maximize that you can see again we've got quite a lot of noise there so let's look at just smoothing that out a little so we'll just go with the default 50 percent okay so that seems to have done the trick so you could go ahead and press ok and then what i'd like to do is just lower the z height of this part so we'll take that go into the properties i'm just going to decrease this and make that zero 0.08 and that's just soften that a little then we can close out there and so you can see we've got quite a nice texture here and what I could do is look at just taking a selection of this to create a texture tile so let's just tile the windows I'm going to go into the drawing tab where I'm going to draw a rectangle I'm just going to sketch roughly around an area that I'd like to create a texture tile from Okay, so I've got that there, close that down and we take the component, shift and select the vector and we'll go into the modeling tab where I can clear all of the component outside of the selected vectors. So when I do that it's going to remove everything outside the vector that we just created there. So I could use this texture tile in a different project and there's definitely potential for creating components from images but it's good to know the limitations. Now depending on the quality of the image depends on the quality of the model that you'll get. If I import a JPEG, a bitmap, a GIF or a PNG then it will only find 256 Z levels in the model. So if there are a lot of shallow curves and I scale it up or down we may see stepping on it. 
If a file is saved as a 16-bit TIFF file, then the software can interpret up to 65,000 Z levels and so would get a much smoother model. And these models are specialist files and are specially prepared as grayscale height maps. Now one example that you'll see this is to making terrain maps and you can find out more information on terrain maps on the Vectric user forum. So let's just take everything here, we're just going to delete it. So we've seen a number of ways that we can import data into the software to create a 3D component. We also have ways to export 3D data into different file formats. Now typically in the software the end result is to take the model and create the toolpaths to cut on your CNC. In some cases you may want to save the 3D data. One way is to save the files as native Aspire files, so that's the .crv3d or your .3d clip files, where you could look at importing them back into the software at a later date to bring into other designs. You may want to export models as another 3D format and take that into another design package and use that as a part within another software program. You can also export 3D data and export it as an image file which you may want to put on a laser or a photo editing program and use the editing tools in there and resave and re-import back into the software. Now these are fairly specialist applications, but I'll show you the techniques to export different types of files now. So let's go to File, Open, we're going to open the FLIR2.CRV3D file. I'll go ahead and open that out. I'm not going to save this. Okay, so here is my FLIR file here. If we just tile the windows, we can see the model. If we go into the modeling tab, we can see all of the individual parts. So you'll remember when we imported this FLIR2 model, it only imported the overall part as a composite model. But now that we're in the actual file itself, we're able to access all of the individual parts that make up this FLIR. So I'm going to show you how you can export individual clip art, grouped clip art, clip art that's within a level and the overall composite model out as a dot 3D clip file. So I'll start by looking at an individual piece of clip art. So you simply select the component in the component tree, right click, use the option here to export that out as a piece of 3D clip and you can just simply save that out. And then you could just go and re-import that uh, at a later date. Now if we grouped, let's say for instance we take these three components and we right click and we use the group option here, I could then export that group out as a piece of 3D clip art where I could access that. So I could right click here, use the option to export that as a 3D clip file and then here I could just simply save that and then when I come to locate that file I can access all of the individual pieces of clip art that are within that group. So let's just ungroup that, so we'll right click and use the ungroup option. If I wanted to export all of the components that are within a level I could right click on the level and use the option here to export as a 3D clip file and I could just simply give that a name press save and then again I could re-import that it will come in as a group that will contain all four of these components and then if I had multiple levels in my job and I wanted to export the whole thing out as a .3D clip file where I could still access all of the individual parts I could come over to model and then I could use the option here to export as a 3D clip art and again I could just give that a name and save that out. And so then at a later date I could come in to my clip art tab and I could use the add folder option or I could browse my local files so I could find the folder and you can see that I have all of the uh, .3D clip files that we saved out and I could just re-import them into my new job. We can also take any set of components in the software and export them out as STL or OBJ mesh files. It doesn't matter if they're grouped or not. So if we go into the modeling tab, we can use this icon here to export visible model as an STL file. 
And what it will do, the software will take the composite model to generate the mesh file. And so here what we need to do is define the quality of the model by setting the tolerance or defining a maximum number of triangles to generate the model. In this case we'll go and set the tolerance. So we're just going to make that one thousandth of an inch. And then what we could do is we could just simply go ahead and press triangulate. And then we could output this mesh by using this option here to save out the triangulation. So let's just maximise the 3D view and if we just zoom in there you can see that we are seeing this faceting as we get closer to the model. If we use this option here to undraw the shaded triangulation this will show us with a wireframe drawing so we can see all of those triangle facets. So what we could do is we could look at making the tolerance a lot smaller. So I could just make that a little bit smaller and then we'll go ahead and triangulate that. And so you'll see straight away that the software has calculated that and created a much finer mesh. And if I use the check option here to draw the shaded triangulation, you can see that we can no longer see any facets there. We have a nice, smooth, denser mesh. This will ultimately mean that we are going to have a larger file size in terms of memory. Now, as well as controlling the quality of the mesh by defining the tolerance and the triangles, we can choose how we close this off. So we could use the leave open option and if I just turn this around, you'll see that we have a hollowed back there. We could also choose to close this off with an inverted front and what that will do is it will just create a full 3D part where it's basically a copy of the front side on the back there. And then we have the option to close off with a flat plane which is just a flat plane on the back there. Now these last two options here you may want to use with a 3D printer. It works better if the part is completely sealed off. Now once you've got your desired settings and it looks correct then you could go and save out the triangulation. So if we use the save triangulation option and so you can use this drop down box here so you could save that out as an STL, an OBJ or a POV Racine file, which is a specialist shaded file. In this case, you're probably going to want to save that out as an STL, and then you can import that into a program that supports 3D mesh files, or you could take it straight to a 3D printer. In this case, I'm not going to save this, I'm just going to cancel that, and we're going to close out of this form here. So now we're going to look at a method where we can export the model as a 2D image. Again, whatever the software can see as the composite model is what will be exported. So let's go over to model. We're going to use this option here to export as a grayscale bitmap. So here I'm going to go to the save as type and I'm going to choose the 16-bit TIFF file. So this will export that out into 65,000 levels of grey. I could give that a name and I could just go ahead and save that out and would have a 2D representation of the 3D model. And any transparent or modelling plane will be black and anything with height will be white. And so that really completes this tutorial on importing and exporting 3D data into the software and you can access all of the files that I've used for this demonstration in the importing and exporting 3D data folder. Thank you for watching.